coffee break conversations. This is going to be a, um, actually a press conference, um, something uh, that hasn't been done uh, in Vega conferences, so uh, an online press conference with the Prime Minister. Uh, I, I'm not sure quite about the format we're going to proceed. I think I'm going to kick off with a couple of questions and, and then just feel free like in a press conference. Um, and I'll, I'll try to moderate all of it. So, uh, and, and don't um, uh, be concerned too much about the fact that we're in an empty room. Um, we're, uh, we are being broadcast all over the world and hopefully someone's watching. So, uh, and, and we're having um, also people who are not, who are present only virtually can uh, ask questions as well. We have uh, some questions already coming in via Twitter. So, um, so a Q&A session both here uh, for those who are present and for those who are following us virtually. Um, uh, Prime Minister Valdis Dombrovskis uh, here. Um, I will just, I think, commands by recapping a couple of points you made yesterday about Euro um, and why is it uh, worth fighting for the common currency. And if I understood correctly, you, you said in reaction to the latest developments uh, with reference to, to uh, ECB decisions and, and um, uh, German court decisions and the rest of it, that uh, basically we now see the end uh, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, and we will have some, uh, maybe a half a year of bumpy road ahead of us, but, but basically we're on the right path. So uh, if you could expand on that. Are, are, is there a light? Is, the, is it a big light at the end of the tunnel? Or? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So as regards this, your uh, first question, well, uh, that's uh, uh, what it seems to be, that uh, with the uh, last decisions taken, uh, Eurozone has uh, dealt with uh, one of the problems which was uh, preventing Eurozone from successfully uh, dealing with, it, uh, with its crisis, uh, namely that uh, financial markets were questioning the size of the firewall. Is there enough money in EFSF and ESM to deal with the crisis? And with the latest uh, decision of ECB, uh, the answer seems to be yes, because uh, there will be also ECB liquidity available uh, to countries which will need it. And as I also mentioned, it's positive that it comes with uh, strict conditionality, so countries how to apply for a bailout, how to uh, agree on the conditionality, and only then uh, countries will be able to uh, benefit from this uh, ECB uh, liquidity. So all in all, uh, really we see that Eurozone has taken a number of uh, steps and initiatives to deal with uh, medium to long term issues, uh, in, uh, including on strengthening both economic governance and fiscal discipline within uh, Eurozone, al also uh, within uh, the whole European Union. And uh, it has taken a number of steps on short term resolution of the crisis, including creation of EFSF and ESM. But size of those funds have been a question so far, and the CCB uh, decision should remove those uh, doubts. So where we expect uh, trouble, we still expect trouble with the Greek problem, uh, in a sense that uh, they are in a second bailout and seem to be falling behind even the commitments in a second bailout, so it will be difficult to deal with this uh, 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 Greek situation to ensure that they stick with the conditions in order uh, for uh, Eurozone to be able to proceed with uh, next bailout payments. All right. I think we can, uh, well, we, uh, we stay on, on the subject of the, of the latest developments on the Eurozone. If there are any questions that uh, uh, need to be clarified with the Prime Minister? Uh, we had a question from an Italian financial journalist coming over Twitter. And uh, you mostly... Uh, was a question about whether the ECB decisions have stabilized the Eurozone, which we answered already, and about the prospects of uh, Greece exiting still. I mean, basically, you're saying that the likelihood uh, is less now, or, or is it still uh, uh, an option that... Uh, well, I would say that the uh, likelihood is less now, but it's still important that Greece uh, sticks with the uh, conditions and actually uh, does its part of the job, as other countries in bailouts programs are doing. Right. Um, yeah, go on. Uh, 
Can I just uh, wait for the uh, microphone? Yes, thank you. Alex, oh, Alex Toppin, uh, Reuters News Agency. Uh, Mr. Dombrovskis, in more than three years as a prime minister, what mistakes you have made that you would recommend for Italy and Spain to avoid? All right. That's a good one, isn't it? Well, that's, uh, that's really a good uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> Uh, 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 in a sense, uh, certainly there had been uh, mistakes as regards some uh, specific uh, uh, policy, in, uh, policy initiatives. Uh, uh, if you look, for example, on issues like uh, uh, personal income taxation, we had been uh, bans uh, bumping down and up. It uh, moved from 25 uh, before the uh, crisis to 23, then to 26, then back to 25. and. Uh, uh, so there had, has been some uh, uh, inconsistencies, to, so to say, in some uh, uh, decision making. But uh, of course, it was uh, uh, extremely difficult crisis. So, uh, and uh, more, it was really about, uh, uh, especially at the beginning of the crisis, in maintaining countries' uh, solvency and sometimes those immediate crisis resolutions uh, considerations were. Uh, overtaking some uh, medium and longer term uh, considerations. So it's, if it's possible to also uh, keep those in mind, so uh, in mind while dealing with the crisis, so to have a uh, more or less clear idea where you want to head after the crisis and then try to uh, stick with this more or less uh, during the crisis, then certainly it uh, would make somewhat smoother, uh, smoother uh, road. But uh, another uh, uh, mistake I think which we didn't make, but which uh, still would help, uh, would be helpful for uh, Spain and Italy and some other countries to avoid, is in a sense that we did this fiscal adjustment which was needed in a front-loaded manner. We did uh, bulk of it already during the crisis, especially in 2009, in order to restore financial uh, stability. And with restoration of financial stability, we were able to return to the economic growth uh, really quickly. And uh, right now, we are fastest growing EU economy. Uh, uh, GDP growth in the first half of this year was 5.9 percent. Last year, it was 5.5 percent. So. Uh, and really uh, what uh, uh, we see is that trying to delay the adjustment is not the right strategy. And that seems to be what some countries are trying just to delay this adjustment. But without, without uh, doing the adjustment, you will not restore the confidence of financial markets and you will just uh, continue to get deeper into trouble. So that's probably uh, something which could be learned from Latvia's experience. I think uh, if I may continue Alexa's point, uh, well, the question is, I mean, we have been going back and forth about this, but um, the larger debate is whether our lessons are applicable to the others um, in, in South and Europe in particular. Um, and, 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 and you mentioned uh, again and again, I think obviously this could have been a very valuable lesson, this front-loading of uh, fiscal adjustment. Um, to Latvia, but but you, do you really think? I mean, this is a could be applicable to countries like Spain and Italy and Greece and the uh, uh, rest of them, because you know if you front load too much, uh, you can capsize the ship. Is it is it not the case? I mean, the Latvian case perhaps was a you know a, a, a very specific case where you could could do that, whereas the other front loads would be so heavy in other countries that it just wouldn't work. So a broader point about the applicability. I mean, is, it, is, is, is your perspective not changing on, on the applicability of Latvian lessons to the other countries? Uh, well, I think uh, it's uh, still applicable because what we see, at least in the case of Greece, for Spain and Italy, it's still so to say, relatively open issue, but in the case of Greece, they had been trying to delay this adjustment. And uh, what we see is that this delayed adjustment has not really uh, helped them uh, to restore economic growth, because what they were saying all the time, look, we need to do adjustment more slowly, uh, give us a breathing time, uh, give us another two years, and then this and that. 
uh, and uh, what was happening is that with this they were not able to restore the confidence in financial markets and with this they are just getting deeper into recession, making uh, this adjustment ever more difficult. Right. So, uh, in that, uh, uh, from that point of view, we see that Greece is trying this and other tactics they are trying to delay the adjustment and it's not really working. Right. But, but you know, couldn't you agree? I mean, I, I will stick a bit on this. That, uh, I mean, Latvia had perhaps like five years worth of structural problems at the time when crisis uh, came in 2008. Perhaps a country like Greece has a structural problems going back to 30 years. And it's just not, you know, possible to deal with that amount of change and suffering and, and political sacrifice that's needed that you just couldn't make. So, well, uh, but if you look at the mm, uh, Greek crisis and, and Latvia's crisis, the point is that initial uh, recession, which uh, was uh, uh, in a Greece in the years 2008, 2009, was relatively mild, and just with the failure of Greece to do the necessary adjustment, they were just getting into more severe right. recessions. Whereas in the case of Latvia, we were faced by a very extreme crisis, especially in 2009. So if Greece would have acted uh, with a relatively mild uh, recession in 2009, and even by mid-2010 when they requested the first uh, bailout, and would stick with this conditionality and do the necessary adjustment, I think they would have been in a uh, substantially better situation now. And they wouldn't need to do uh, as much as uh, adjustment as, as Latvia has, because uh, we have done uh, between years 2008 and 2012 uh, some 17 percent of GDP worth of fiscal uh, adjustment. It's more than Greece has done so far. Probably now they will have to do more because they have been delaying it for so many years. But initially they could have gone through with a smaller amount of adjustment. Right. Anyone wants to jump in? Yes, please. Aaron Eagley, does Bloomberg News. Mr. Dombrovskis, you've often referred to Latvia as a success story. I wanted to ask if you think the success has been felt by everyone in this country. During the crisis, your government raised taxes on the poor by cutting the non-taxable minimum income in half. Maybe more than 100,000 people have left during the crisis, and unemployment is way above its pre-crisis level at more than 16 percent. Do you think everyone in Latvia is feeling the success you've been talking about? Uh, well, uh, of course, if you are facing the crisis as Latvia did in 2008-2009, uh, uh, facing some uh, GDP contraction in those two years of more than 20 percent, it's quite clearly that you cannot go out of this crisis without uh, negative consequences. It's just not possible. So it's, uh, the question is, what do you do to minimize the negative consequences? And one of the ways to minimize those consequences is to return to economic growth as quickly as possible. And that's exactly what we uh, seem to uh, have done. In, in a sense, already in the first quarter of 2010, we returned to the quarter-to-quarter -quarter growth, and in the third quarter of 2010, we returned to year-on-year -year growth. And last year, we were third fastest uh, growing EU economy. This year, we are fastest growing EU economy. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, 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 quite clear. So it's not the question that dealing with a crisis uh, uh, had negative consequences. If you are in this deep crisis, there, is, there are no easy solutions anymore. So then the question is, are other strategies uh, better? Or would devolution help? Would delaying of adjustment help or, or something like this? And, and frankly, I speak, uh, no. It, it really, uh, we can see it from a, a, a countries which had been trying to do uh, several subsequent uh, uh, devolutions, if it was making a uh, social situation easier. We are seeing the countries which are trying to delay the adjustment. It's also not making the situation easier. So I think uh, all in all, Latvia's uh, strategy to deal with the crisis uh, was uh, relatively successful, especially because we were able to return to economic uh, growth relatively uh, quickly, which also then helps with the job creation, which is also now helping us 
uh, say with 2012 budget amendments, with 2013 budget, to start, say, lower tax taxes again as regards uh, personal income tax taxation and to start uh, raising salaries to public sector employees, starting with uh, certain categories of uh, teachers, with uh, policemen, firefighters, uh, prison guards, uh, workers in uh, social, uh, 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 social secu uh, security institutions, and so on and so on. So uh, exactly because we have this growth, it now also helps us to return to the policies of uh, uh, wage growth while still sticking with our fiscal targets and this will make also uh, pe ever more people to feel that real situation is starting to improve. Yeah, go on. Yeah, Mike Collier, Agence France Press. Um, one of the buzzwords that we've heard in the last couple of days and which you've already used a few times uh, during this discussion is conditionality. I just wanted to press you on what we really mean by conditionality, because uh, do we mean uh, stopping paying any money to a country like Greece, letting the economy collapse? Do we mean withdrawing their voting rights at EU level? Uh, what exactly do we mean by conditionality? And isn't it a bit of a hollow threat, given that so many times in the past, European policymakers have said, well, we've drawn a line in the sand, we've finally got the firepower we need. What makes it different this time around, and what should the consequences be? for conditionality? Uh, well, as regards uh, conditionality, so conditionality basically has to be uh, met, and that's, uh, that's what it's all about. And uh, if we see that uh, now most of the countries with bailout programs are having their conditions met and uh, continue with their bailout programs, uh, then in case of Greece, we see that there are serious doubts if conditions are being met, and that's why this next payment for Greece has been uh, delayed already for several months. So the point is that uh, if you uh, make uh, a bailout, you agree on certain conditions, those conditions have to be fulfilled. And mainly it's uh, regards to the uh, budget deficit reduction targets because nobody is interested to finance unsustain unsustainable situation. If country fails to reduce its uh, budget deficits, then it's uh, basically no reason to pay in a bottomless uh, place. So you would expect that uh, international lenders, the Troika, who are now doing the report on, on Greece's uh, meeting the uh, conditionality, they, they would be quite strict about that there's a bottom line to, uh, you expect them to be strict uh, this uh, autumn? Uh, well, I would expect them uh, being strict. Uh, of course, there are always possibilities for some adjustments, some minor adjustments, also given uh, the situation that macroeconomics outlook for Greece is now worse than it was uh, when uh, conditionality was drafted. So there are certain things uh, which you, of course, have to keep in mind. But all, on, uh, all in all, those uh, program targets uh, should be on credible paths that Greece is uh, uh, meeting the program targets, given some, maybe some possible adjustments, uh, given the macroeconomic situation, and that they are on a credible path to reduce budget deficit and being able to return uh, to financial markets, because uh, no, uh, no bailout is uh, possible uh, to continue indefinitely. So there has to be clear exit strategy. How do you move from your bailout? How do you stabilize your finances? How do you return to the uh, financial markets and start functioning as a normal country again? Right. Uh, as I remember from a Finnish newspaper, Amleti, I have a question about emigration. Tens of thousands of young Latvians have gone abroad to find some work. Uh, even in Finland, and it's a good thing for Finland, of course. But uh, are you not afraid that after the Latvia's entry into the Eurozone, the emigration flows, young people, people are going more and more abroad from Latvia? Uh, well, as regards emigration, it's uh, certainly the uh, biggest problem we are facing. And uh, if we look at the reasons of this emigration, it's uh, mainly unemployment, 
and uh, uh, mainly so lack of uh, jobs in Latvia. And uh, that's uh, why we come back to the point I was uh, talking uh, just a couple of minutes ago. That's, that's why it's so important for us to have this economic growth and have a job creation. Because if there are new jobs, if there are salary increases and so on, people will feel that there is a uh, future in Latvia and they will be less inclined to look uh, uh, elsewhere. So it's quite... Uh, 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 clear that this is a big uh, problem for Latvia and, and we need uh, to do, deal with this. But uh, it's, uh, I think the fundamental answer is uh, anyway uh, economy and we have seen it in a sense uh, already in 2004-2005 just after Latvia joined the EU and free movement of labor at least to some uh, EU countries was uh, possible that tens of thousands of Latvians were leaving. But we also see that, say, in the years 2006 and 2007, with economic growth, with salary growth, this process slowed down and even uh, reverted to the extent more Latvians started to return. Well, bubble as it all was, and it burst, but it showed this uh, tendency. If there is economic development, if there are jobs, uh, people are not uh, interested to uh, go somewhere else. So economy is a first and fundamental issue. Second is how to keep uh, contact with Latvians abroad. So we are now uh, starting uh, several new initiatives uh, in a sense of uh, mm, uh, Parliament is now, uh, I hope, finalizing the discussions about citizenship law, uh, relaxing uh, double citizenship rules, making sure that Latvian citizens living abroad and their uh, children can uh, claim uh, double citizenship. Uh, it's uh, also providing some assistance to Latvian communities for uh, weekend schools to teach Latvian, uh, to uh, organize some summer camps of Latvian children from abroad uh, in Latvia and so on. So basically to make sure that we uh, stay in contact with uh, this uh, community uh, abroad and uh, uh, make sure that at least part of some returns and use also uh, the potential of those who stays also for the benefit of Latvia. Right, I th yeah, please. Thank you. Um, Mary Dzerzhevsky from the London newspaper, The Independent. Um, this time last year, um, it was almost accepted that um, Latvia was the model for um, countries facing economic crisis. And you've explained today about front-loading and how you recommend that. Um, but in the last year, we've seen several trends away from that in Europe, from the whole philosophy of um, GDP and growth being the, um, being the gauge to judge national success. Um, we've seen moves to the left, especially in France, where they were talking about less austerity rather than more. Do you think maybe the, the Latvian model um, of austerity first is outdated and that we're looking at a different, um, different um, understanding of success in Europe? Uh, well, uh, if uh, I'm to judge from the uh, developments in the last year, uh, then it seems that, uh, in fact, uh, most of the EU countries agreed to this approach and signed a fiscal compact, uh, which uh, clearly says that countries should reduce their budget deficits and make sure that the structural budget deficit does not exceed 0.5% of countries' uh, GDP. And it's uh, signed by all uh, EU countries except UK and uh, Czech Republic. And also those countries did not sign it for the reasons which had relatively uh, little to do with uh, them being against uh, austerity and rather to do with some uh, other uh, considerations. So if we look at the uh, facts, what decisions are being taken in the EU, we, in fact, we see that there is uh, uh, almost universal acceptance that we need to bring our public finances in order. And with uh, uh, Europe's public debt approaching by now some 90% of GDP, 
it's quite clear that we will not be uh, able to uh, stimulate uh, economy forever with just uh, excessive deficits. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's what Europe has been doing for decades previously, and now we are uh, facing the consequences. And uh, as I was said also in the uh, uh, opening of the Riga conference, that this crisis is not so much a euro as a currency crisis, it's rather a debt crisis. So we need to deal with that, that part of the problem, and we see that uh, Europe has recognized it, and Europe is dealing with the debt problem. We could switch now. Uh, um. I don't know what to do. I'll ask one question, and, and we're we'll back to the uh, to the uh, journalists. Um, I, I, I wanted to switch to Latvia's um, objective of euro adoption, uh, and there was a, a funny piece of statistics out just yesterday, uh, which showed that uh, just 13 to 14 percent of Latvian uh, citizens of the Latvian society support euro adoption, and and. Uh, I said this is a funny piece of statistics because it shows again, uh, well, that, that we're, you know, diametrically opposite to the Greeks because Greeks seem not to be okay with austerity but want to keep the euro. We're, we seem to be okay with austerity but don't want the euro. Um, so uh, how would you explain that? I mean, 13, 14 percent, I mean, it, obviously... Latvia does not have to have a referendum technically or, or legally to adopt the currency, but is 13, 14% okay, in your opinion, to, to go on with the plan? Uh, well, so as regards this uh, public opinion, we certainly right. see that uh, public is less optimistic about Euro than it was two or three years ago. And I think it's uh, only uh, obvious because what we uh, hear about Eurozone for already almost three years is uh, crisis, crisis, and then a crisis. And so it's quite clear that people are asking questions, so why join? It's crisis out there. Uh, so uh, from that point of view, of course, we need to go to some uh, economic reasoning right. why it is worth to join. And uh, there are a couple of arguments which I think uh, 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 we need uh, to take into consideration. First, Latvian LUTs is anyway pegged to Euro. So whatever is happening to Euro is uh, happening to Latvian LUTs. So from that point of view, economically speaking, there are no uh, reasons uh, not to join. Uh, uh, and if somebody still would argue that, no, 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 let's not uh, join, it's a crisis in, in, in Eurozone, then, uh, technically speaking, we should be also debating should we keep Latvia's uh, peg uh, to the euro? Okay. And nobody is debating this, nobody is requesting this. Uh, otherwise, it's, I, I would say it's more emotions than economic reasoning. If we say we do not trust the euro, sorry, we are pegged right. to the euro, then we have to change our mind. Quit exchange rate mechanism to end, I don't know, peg our currency to something else or go for a free, uh, free float or, or, or something. Nobody is uh, discussing this. I wouldn't even uh, encourage uh, this idea to be discussed because... Uh, but that seems completely, uh, in, a, econom in, in economic terms, unreasonable to design those scenarios of maybe unpegging and, and exiting exactly, the area. Exactly. No uh, sense at all to do that. No, I don't think there is, uh, especially if we look at uh, Latvia's foreign trade structure and so, I don't think there is any reason for Latvia to unpeg its currency uh, for, from the euro. And uh, then if you look at uh, issues like uh, mm, uh, transaction uh, costs, like uh, price transparency and so, there are many uh, practical benefits why it would make uh, sense uh, for Latvia to uh, join the eurozone. But uh, quite clearly, when we just recently updated this Latvia's plan for Euro, Euro introduction, among other things, we of course also foresee, foresaw uh, uh, resources for informative campaign, actually explaining first the reasoning of joining, and Finance Ministry also signed with a memorandum with the European Commission, which uh, they are also participating in this program. And, well, once that is done, also explaining the technicalities. But, of course, first you need to explain this 
economical reasoning why it makes uh, sense to join. Okay, just, and, just one. Uh, just the yeah. last uh, uh, argument on this. Of course, uh, one uh, country which experience we can study is Estonia, because it's our neighbor right. country with relatively similar currency regime, which uh, joined in 2011. And according to the latest Eurobarometer uh, data, 71% of Estonians are satisfied with the fact that Estonia joined uh, Eurozone. Is that a justifiable um, attitude? Because it's, you know, if you, you, you're counting psychological factors against, then maybe there are psychological factors for. But, but you see, I mean, Estonian example is something not only in terms of the attitude, but, but in just economic lessons and the experience, you see that all, you know, that, it, that, it's, um, that it's beneficial, basically, that it was the right decision. We have an example that says that it's the right thing to do. Do you gather well, that only the positive things from the only example? Well, uh, of course, uh, 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 we uh, study uh, this Estonia's experience quite uh, careful because they joined already during the Eurozone crisis. And uh, still it served as a positive signal about financial and economical stability in uh, Estonia. It uh, helps with attracting uh, foreign investment and it's, in a sense it's also served as a positive signal about stability in the uh, region as a whole. Right. So from uh, those point of views uh, we see that uh, Estonia's accession to Eurozone has certainly had much more positive than uh, negative effects. On, on the negative side, of course... We have course, overtaken them in growth rates without the adoption at the moment. Uh, well, uh, of course, for that you also need to look at the uh, basis. And right. uh, last year, after adopting uh, Euro, uh, Estonia was the fastest growing EU economy. So basically we are just maybe in an economic cycle lagging some uh, right. half a year behind Estonia. So. Let me present you one argument before I go back to the audience here uh, that is presented by opponents of euro adoption in Latvia. They say basically that the currency union is not a good idea for countries with such diverse levels of economic development. Basically, they're saying uh, we would be in favor of euro adoption, but only at the time when, when we, you know, our GDP per capita level reaches somewhere in the vicinity of the German level. Um, you, you think that that is not the case. Actually, it would be quite different that your adoption would, would make Latvia grow faster than, than all the rest of the scenarios. Uh, uh, well, uh, certainly so. Uh, I don't think there is uh, uh, much uh, reason uh, uh, to say that uh, countries with, uh, well, different GDPs per capita cannot be in currency union. In fact, if you look at the current Eurozone, already the differences are quite big. Yeah, but, but the uh, example is, you know, uh, but, uh, there are a lot of problems in the Eurozone, that's the, uh, that's the argument. But, uh, 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 and also if you look on those uh, problems, so the problem countries are those with the highest uh, debt and budget deficit levels and not with the lowest uh, GDPs per capita because Estonia's GDP per capita is also one of the lowest in Eurozone and, and yet they are not uh, uh, in, uh, in trouble. Right. But uh, 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 from uh, uh, that point of view, uh, uh, if we have a fixed exchange rate, yeah. from monetary point, uh, policy point of view, we are already uh, quasi in Eurozone. We cannot do much about uh, our exchange rate. And in fact, Latvia has a fixed exchange rate already since 1994. And, uh, and before uh, currency was not falling but appreciating, right. before 1994. So uh, we have moved from a, a very low GDPs per capita in 1994 to where we are now with a fixed exchange rate. And we only had to repeg in 2005 from special drawing rights to euro because we joined exchange rate mechanism too. Uh, so, uh, and for a very small and open economy like Latvia, it also serves as a kind of answer that we are uh, fixed to something bigger. We do not try to float our currency because it may turn out to be very uh, volatile in a sense. Right, risky thing. Yeah, please. 
Uh, on, the, on this same subject, uh, uh, you told us yesterday that Latvia is on uh, target or kind of on the threshold now of meeting the Maastricht criteria. But even if uh, Latvia meets the criteria with room to spare at the end of this year, there's a chance that the uh, ECB and European Commission might decide not to uh, invite uh, Latvia to join the Eurozone in 2014. How would you react to such a decision? And in order to uh, offset the chance of this happening, which existing Eurozone countries have told you that they will definitely support Latvia's accession if it meets the Maastricht criteria? Uh, well, so on the uh, first question, uh, really according to the Bank of Latvia analysis, is it, this is this month when we basically uh, start uh, fulfilling all Maastricht criteria, and uh, which uh, uh, gives us a good chances next, early next year to uh, request a convergence report from the European Commission, thus basically launching this procedure of uh, Euro adoption. And so far, signals we are hearing from the uh, uh, European Union is that uh, it is important uh, to meet master criteria, but should this be the case, that there would be no artificial obstacles. After all, it's uh, also the Commission which has uh, signed uh, uh, during the Latvia's bailout program MOU and SMOUs with Latvia, which foresees, by the way, this Euro adoption goal in January 1, 2014. So, in a sense, the Commission has already signed up to this. Well, of course, given if Latvia fulfills master criteria. And what would your reaction be if, if um, you, well, what's the plan B, really, uh, if, if it goes wrong at the beginning of the next year, if we don't uh, get the uh, invitation, basically, to, do, to, to join? Well, I think we uh, uh, currently should work for the plan A and the signals we are hearing that if we are uh, to meet uh, master criteria, no artificial obstacles will be created. And in fact, uh, again, uh, coming back to my favorite example of Estonia, <laughs> also before uh, Estonia's uh, accession to Eurozone, there were many debates. Oh, there is Eurozone's enlargement fatigue. Oh, we should sort out our problems first and then think about enlargement second. Oh, Estonia is a small country somewhere in Eastern Europe, whatever. And at the end of the, the day, we uh, saw on this example that no, this Eurozone uh, enlargement process is still processing uh, very much as it's foreseen by the legislation, as it's foreseen by EU treaty. Right. where in fact all EU new member states have an obligation to join, not even a uh, rights to join. I find it hard to believe that you don't have a plan B. Come on. Well, uh, currently we're working for a plan A, <laughs> right. and I hope it will succeed. <laughs> all right. Other questions, please. Mr. Dombrovskis, what would have to happen in the Eurozone for you to change your mind about joining outside of a collapse of the Eurozone? Uh, well, uh, certainly uh, the, uh, there were many uh, debates on, on uh, different, well, if you wish, doomsday scenarios for, uh, uh, for Eurozone, but so far we see that those scenarios are not really fulfilling. Instead, we see that Eurozone is uh, dealing with the crisis, it's dealing with uh, structural problems, it's strengthening fiscal discipline and economic governance, and it's uh, putting enough resources uh, to deal with a current crisis in specific uh, EU or Eurozone member states. So from that point of view, uh, I think there is a degree of uh, confidence that Eurozone is dealing with its problems, and uh, again, there uh, is no reason for Latvia not to join from that point of view. Yeah. Do you see any advantages staying outside the Eurozone at all? Well, uh, only advantage I could think of is that uh, in this case we would not have to pay contributions to ESM. Uh, that's uh, probably the only uh, tangible advantage, but first, of course, we hope that bulk of the Eurozone problems will be solved Without before 2014. <laughs> All right. That's a very practical <laughs> consideration. And, uh, uh, then we, we should delay for half a year. Uh, maybe still more problems will be solved by, by mid-2014. 
2014 well, uh, or something? Uh, as I said, I, I don't see uh, <laughs> there is uh, uh, many good reasons uh, to delay. I see that there are many good reasons to join, and on a con side, what I can see is really this uh, issue of uh, ESM, uh, where we'll have to uh, make our contribution, but since it's anyway paid in uh, capital, it's uh, to the extent similar to IMF. And if ESM is not going to lose the money, we are also not going to lose the money. All right. Uh, we're almost out of time, so uh, I will just uh, conclude coming back to that point. I, I don't know whether you uh, uh, would like to answer that or not, but, but, but still, I mean, the 13, 14 percent of support for your adoption among the society, and, and, and you, you spoke about the, that we're going to have a debate and an information campaign and all the rest of it, but do you imagine a scenario where Latvia has a referendum on that issue? Uh, a consultative referendum, maybe, and not a legally binding one? Uh, well, if the support remains so unconvincing. Uh, well, uh, from the government side, we do not plan to call for a, a referendum uh, for two reasons. First of all, uh, already in 2003, uh, uh, Latvia has voted in a referendum for EU accession treaty with all its... Uh, important conditions, including Latvia's uh, co commitment to join the Eurozone. Uh, second, out of the uh, 10 2004 enlargement countries, five already have joined the Eurozone. None of them was making referendums. Right. Okay. Okay, let, us, uh, let me conclude just by, uh, just by asking... Um, where, where, what is your projection of uh, when Latvia is going to be entirely out of this slump in GDP? I mean, when, when are we going to reach the pre-crisis level of our GDP? When, when we, w we would be able to say that we're, you know, the crisis is really uh, behind us? Well, uh, in uh, nominal terms, we'll be reaching pre-crisis uh, GDP probably next year. All right. Uh, but uh, I don't think that this is the Pretty best uh, uh, indicator, because if you look at the GDP structure before the crisis with all the real estate bubble and construction boom, I don't think we want to replicate this. Right. Uh, I don't we think we want real estate prices of 2007, uh, and then think that for that reason we have more GDP. <laughs> Well, uh, if one uh, owns a lot of apartments, then maybe so, it uh, Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, uh, from that point of view, it's important to uh, see uh, the structure of economy. And we see that right now there is much more emphasis on industrial production and exports on a productive sectors and economy, which are also creating more uh, jobs. And from that point of view, we had uh, on average some 10% increase in industrial production for last two years each year, and 30% increase in uh, exports. But what I think will be an important indicator of uh, Latvia being out of the crisis is to have uh, reasonably low unemployment. I think that's the uh, most important uh, indicator which will show how many people in Latvia will feel that we are out of the crisis. So if we will have a reasonably low levels of uh, unemployment, this, I think, will be the most uh, uh, important indicator how, how you can uh, feel. And unfortunately, unemployment is typically lagging behind the economical cycle. It takes some maybe half a year and a year uh, for unemployment to build up once crisis starts, and then it takes several years actually for unemployment to go down. So I, I would be rather watching uh, uh, unemployment uh, no, and not GDP per uh, capita as a main indicator to see if Latvia is out of the crisis. Correct. Um, yep, yeah, we still have minus 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, the last question, please. <laughs> when is Latvia going to reach its pre-crisis level in real terms, not in nominal terms? Right. And when you mentioned unemployment, the unemployment level went up in the first quarter, partly as a result of your government closing or shrinking the 100-lot program, according to the IMF, the Central Bank, and the Central Statistics Bureau. Uh, well, uh, so uh, first of all, on, uh, uh, on real terms, 
uh, as I said, in real terms, we may be coming it uh, uh, maybe in a two or, or three years, but I don't think this is the most uh, important indicator, as I said, because we have a different structure of economy now, and we shouldn't try to replicate the stru structure of economy of 2007 and then claim that's a big success, that's what we want to achieve. No, that's exactly not what we want to achieve, that's how we went into trouble. Uh, and uh, as regards uh, uh, 100 lots program, yes, we are gradually downsizing this 100 lots uh, program uh, because uh, we also, uh, from the very beginning, communicated that this program and this additional social, social safety network we uh, have foreseen as a temporary set of measures to deal with the social consequences. So, of the crisis. And uh, from that point of view, I think this uh, social safety net uh, served as a very good service, but uh, of course we are now gradually downsizing the uh, scale of this uh, program, including the scale of temporary works program, because what we hear now from uh, entrepreneurs ever and ever more that in fact what they are confronted with is a, a, a lack of labor and not uh, not as a way uh, around. So it seems to uh, it seems that we have a uh, quite substantial structural unemployment uh, problems, um, skills mis mismatch between what uh, skills people have and what skills are uh, demanded by the labor market, and that's something we should now uh, really concentrate on instead of uh, running large uh, temporary works programs. All right, I think this could go on for a while, but we have to call it a day for this press conference. Thank you very much, colleagues, for, for being here, and thank you, Prime Minister Valdis Dombrovskis, for, uh, for, for uh, having this time with us uh, at thank the you. Riga conference. Uh, and we will be back with the uh, online discussions in 10 minutes, and we'll, uh, we'll discuss Belarus then. Uh, thank you very much.